political correctness it seems to be taking up more and more space now and you've been quite vocal against it but it feels like a lot of people don't really understand what it is it is often mixed up with common courtesy for an example can you define political correctness for us why is it not not good well political correctness i would say is fundamentally a collectivist doctrine and Collectivist doctrines insist that the proper way of parsing up the world is through the lens of group identity. So you could think about it as the as part of the expression of identity politics, which is something that's gripped the left, probably something that cost Hillary Clinton the election in, in the United States in the last mm-hmm. election cycle. And so and the the people who are politically correct insist that individuals are basically avatars of their group and that the world is a battleground of groups vying for dominance it in a power it, competition it doesn't matter who you are as an individual it's only what group you belong yes, to yes yes well i would say in in <coughs> within the confines of the politically correct doctrine there aren't individuals <laughs> there are only groups vying for power that's why the politically correct types oppose free speech It isn't that they oppose it. It's worse than that. It's that from within the confines of the politically correct doctrine, there's no such thing as free speech because what you claim as your free speech is actually nothing but your justification of the hierarchy that gives your group dominance. That's everything from the politically correct perspective. And so there's no real possibility even for dialogue between well-meaning individuals because there's no such thing as dialogue to begin with and there's no such thing as well-meaning individuals and so it's almost impossible to overstate how pernicious that doctrine is Mm -hmm. it demolishes the idea of individual sovereignty and the possibility of communication across individuals that's why it produces ideas like um, cultural appropriation Uh because there's no all that happens if you utilize the artifacts of another culture it isn't that you admire them or that it's part of trade or that it's part of the free expression of ideas it's that you're taking away the artifacts of power from that other group in an attempt to foster your own group dominance yeah. everything's viewed through that lens this is if i as if i if i would dress up as an indian for a costume party yeah yeah well that's this. you know that that sort of thing has caused all sorts of trouble in American universities where mm. because they're and and they've produced warnings about Halloween costumes I mean it's absurd in many ways as if dressing up in in Mexican national uniform let's say national clothing or Dutch national clothing for that matter mm-hmm. is some kind of insult it isn't an insult and and even if it was that's Halloween is a time to break rules that's the whole point of the of the of the celebration and so, so So political correctness has corrupted the universities or large fields? As far as I'm concerned, it has. And the universities are doing everything they can to corrupt other institutions. And and the other institutions are foolishly going along for the ride. So you see, for example, and this is probably more true in the U.S. than anywhere else, although also in Canada, Australia as well, that corporations are under the pressure of this politically correct fostering of guilt are admitting despite the fact that there's no scientific validity for this claim whatsoever that their employees are en masse structurally racist and that people are viewing the world through the lens of implicit bias and that we're all fundamentally racist and that that should be rectified through like re-education so um, what unconscious bias retraining programs for which there is there is no evidence whatsoever that those programs work and a substantial amount of evidence that they're counterproductive. And the implicit association test that has been put forward hypothetically to diagnose uh, racism, implicit racism, is not a valid or reliable test and cannot be used for those purposes. And even the makers of the test, Brian Nozak and Anthony Greenwald, have admitted publicly that their test is being misused. All of that's it's, it's all of that's extraordinarily dangerous. And if corporate executives had any sense, they would stop rushing to admit that their corporations are structurally racist. It's a very bad idea. And so, this is all under the influence, you say, of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. neo-Marxism. Yeah, But well, aren't those things 
two separate things. They're completely separate. Mm. You know, and this is something I've been criticized for. Dr. Peterson doesn't understand the difference between neo-Marxism and, and, and postmodernism. It's like, I understand the difference perfectly well. It isn't me that's conflating them. It turns out that the people who push postmodern doctrines in the university almost al always ally themselves with a Marxist viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And that is logically incoherent. But I would say the postmodernists really don't give a damn for logical coherence because they regard that as part of the oppressive, patriarchal, Eurocentric view of the world. The idea that there's an objective reality and all of that and that you can deal with it with logic. Um, I think that there is a an alliance between the postmodern types and the neo-Marxists. And as far as I can, can tell, when I looked at the development of postmodern ideas, which, which really came to prominence in France, mm -hmm. it was all failed Marxists who pushed the doctrine forward. And I think it's, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Identity politics is just Marxism under a different guise. So instead of the narrative being the privileged economic class, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie mm -hmm. against the proletariat, mm -hmm. that didn't sell so well and produced tens of millions of deaths, that fundamental narrative. There was a sleight of hand that said, well, it's not economic class, it's race, or it's mm -hmm. gender, or it's ethnicity, or it's sex. But it doesn't matter because the fundamental narrative is still victimizer versus victim. And so it's Marxism under another guise. And the fact that postmodernists mm -hmm. technically are skeptical of meta-narratives like large-scale explanatory structures should mean that they're equally skeptical about Marxist claims because that's a grand narrative. But in practically speaking, that isn't how it works out. And so this alliance does exist even though conceptually it's completely incoherent. So I really don't believe that the post that postmodernism is something in and of itself. I think it's a it's a camouflage for for Marxism under another name. I see. So, And these ideas of yours, they are the ones that gain you the largest groups of enemies and, and you get yes, most well, criticized the, well, for. Well, the thing is the leftist, the radical leftist types, and I would say they're the leftist collectivists. And I'm, by the way, no fan of right-wing collectivists either. It's just that they don't threaten the universities. There's no right-wing collectivists in the universities, like none. There's no right-wingers. There's no conservatives. There are hardly any liberals in most of the in most of the activist uh, um, disciplines. Um, yeah, the radical left types don't like me at all. And that's okay because the feeling is mutual. I think that the... But they, they can orchestrate vicious attacks and, and hit pieces in the biggest medias. Well, in, I've been, you know, I've had the full gamut of treatment in the media, I would say. And mm -hmm. in Canada, for example, there's a handful of outstanding journalists who act as individuals, um, a, a dozen of them, let's say, uh, maybe slightly less than that. And they've been firmly supporting me the whole time. And the Post Media Group in Canada, which was a consortium of 200 un of newspapers, came out in favor of my free speech stance in relationship to Bill C-16. And so I've been treated very well by, the, by some elements of the media. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely the case that I've also been pilloried as a, and caricatured and stereotyped yeah. as, a, as an alt-right figure, I suppose, sometimes as a far-right figure for that matter, by, by venues that, have, that should have known much, that have, should have known better. Mm -hmm. NBC did a terrible video hit piece on me. It was an appalling piece of, of careless, provocative journalism. It was a, yeah. it was and they a, were exposed. They were exposed it. very yeah. well. It was, it was, I couldn't believe it when I watched it. I thought, not only are you people crooked, but you're stupid and incompetent. Mm -hmm. You should get one of those things right. You shouldn't be all three of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. They interviewed me for 90 minutes, and it was a contentious interview uh, conducted by a narcissistic interviewer. And then they chopped it into like a three-minute teaser that was just outright falsehoods. And then people on YouTube took the actual interview and the edited version and juxtaposed them, showing that yeah. they'd actually reversed the meaning of some of the things I said. I saw it. So, and But so far, the attacks have been... I would say highly counterproductive, mm -hmm. and I've, I've been in this very strange situation, which I have no, I have, I mean, I feel that it's a tenuous situation that every time there's been a protest, say, against my appearance on a university campus, which has happened many times, It or an well. attack piece, mm -hmm. then 
like it's very stressful and and the potential for damaging my reputation appears high but the medium to long-term consequence of that is that the journalists end up more discredited than me 